Uh, in your in your workbook, as I said already, and I'll say again, there's going to be um, there's going to be some blanks in there that you'll be filling out along the way, and and by no means do I want this to be boring. But most of this stuff you already know. But this is just getting right down to the bottom foundations of what we believe and why we believe it. And there's several. There's after this book, there's two more books that we're going to go through. So this ain't the end, uh, and uh, so we're going to be digging into to the word. So. Tonight is the introductory, and uh, we're going to be going through this, and it's really, really, uh, I've, just studying through this has really been good for me, and I hope it is for you as well, and uh, like I said, last thing I want to do is bore you to death, I hope that ain't the case, uh, I hope we all can learn something through this. So, uh, the life-changing objectives uh, is to trust in the power of God's truth to change your life. To anticipate in faith the changes that learning doctrine will make in you. So we're going to be go going through this uh, this week or this tonight, and then we're going to be going through this in the following weeks. And like I said earlier, we may or may not. This may last more than an hour. Uh, and if it does, if you need to leave, then y'all can slip right on out. Uh, but. Uh, we're going to spend some time together, so it's really, really, really good. So, this series is, is about, obviously, about foundations. Um, we're going to talk about one of the most important aspects of everyone's life. It is the center of how we live. Listen to this. It determines the decisions that we make, how we treat the people we love, the emotions we experience throughout the day, and the eternal impact that we make. I'm talking about our world view. Our world view. The set of beliefs that form the glasses through which we see the world. So how do we develop this world view and what causes us to develop that world view? Uh, so there are four classic world view questions that we must answer. The first is, who am I? The second is, where am I? The third is, what's wrong? And the fourth is, what's the remedy? So I know this is new as we go through this workbook. So as we get to the first sections of the workbook that you'll be filling out, I'll make sure I point out to you, hey, here we go. We're going to start filling in the blanks now, okay? So uh, I don't want you to spend a whole lot of time looking at your workbook and not paying attention to the good stuff in this. So, so what is your worldview? Uh, here's an example. We're going to do something kind of fun, maybe. But we're going, to take, we're going to take this side, all two of you. Uh, we're going to have a world view. We're going to develop a world view, if you will, of the color red. Okay? The color red, as an example. Get y'all thinking. So this side of the room, here's what I want your world view to be of the color red. Y'all with me? I want your world view to be is this, that you hate the color red. You hate the color red. Can y'all do that? All right. Dwight and Ross, here's your worldview, okay? Y'all hate the color red, Ross and, and Dwight. Here's your worldview on the color red. The driving force in your view of the world is that you love red. The driving force... The driving force in your view of this world, of the world, is that you love red. You hate red, the driving force is that you love red. All right? We'll do uh, y'all's four right there in the middle. So Mike, Christy, Tommy, and Lisa. We're going to have y'all's view this way. We got you love red, your driving force is that you, that you hate the color red. The other way around. No, you hate the color red. I'm getting this right. The driving force is in your view of the world. It's you love red. You hate red, you love red. All right, the next one is your most cherished belief is there's no such thing as the color red. Y'all four. There's no such thing as the color red. You hate red, you love red. There's no such thing as the color red. Okay? And the fourth, back on the back row. All right, the fourth is this. Your worldview is that you should all get along with each other regardless of what you think of the color red. 
That's your worldview. Okay? You hate red. You love red. What's y'all in the middle? Y'all don't believe in the color red. And y'all believe on the back row that it don't matter what you believe as long as everybody, regardless of what you think, uh, what is it? The worldview is that you should all get along regardless of what you think of the color red. All right? No, he's in the, he's in the middle. Yeah, he's in the middle. All right, ready? So then, we're going to pretend, now that y'all have got all those worldviews tonight, I'm going to pretend like I've got an apple. Okay, here it is. All right, y'all ready? Now, when I, when I ask this question, I want you to shout your responses based off the worldview that you have. Y'all ready? All right, ready? Here we go. I got this apple. Ready? How would you like a red apple? Huh? <laughs> you, you don't like red? That's not real? Everybody loves apples. You hate apples. Not red. You don't want a red apple. Y'all did good. Can you feel the energy that the worldview creates? If I'd asked that question before I outlined your, your different views, you would have all answered based on whether you were hungry or not, right? But now you're all focused on the color of the apple. Whether you recognize it or not, listen to this, whether it is at the center of your worldview, whatever is at the center of your worldview becomes the basis for the way you feel about the issues and the basis for the decisions that you make. Let me read that again. Whatever is at the center of your worldview becomes the basis for the way you feel about issues and the basis for the decisions that you make. That's your worldview. That is why one of the most important things about you is your worldview. And yet most of us have haphazardly, haphazardly put together that worldview. Things we were taught as we grew up, the opinions that we hear, the truths that we have been taught from the Bible. They, they all get thrown together into this worldview stew. Often the result is a few of the world. Often the result is the view of the world that is more ours than God's. Listen to this. The good news is God doesn't want it to stay that way. He doesn't want to leave us in the dark. God wants to give us his knowledge, his insight, and we can see clearly in the fact that he sent his son, Jesus, and gave us his word. God wants us, listen, God wants us to know him. God wants us to know him. So, let's be honest. A lot of us have a worldview based off the way we were, grew up, by what we heard, by what we seen. And, and we can argue scripture or discuss scripture based off what we've always heard, not based off what we've read for ourselves and what we've learned for ourselves, right? Y'all ready? Philippians 1, 9 through 10 should be in your book. It says this. As this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you will be able to discern what is best. Circle the words knowledge and depth of insight. Our love and our ability to choose what is best are not ultimately a matter of feelings or even experiences. They grow out of knowledge and out of insight we have about life. Jude one twenty says this, But you, dear friends, must continue to build your lives on the foundation of your holy faith. This is the theme verse of this study. Circle the words foundation and faith. Foundation and faith. Your view of this world is determined by the foundation that you choose to build your life on. Let me say that again. 
Your view of this world is determined by the foundation which you choose to build your life on. Build your life on making money and you'll have a world view. You'll have one view of the world. Build your life on making, uh, build your life on making money and you'll have, the, uh, you'll have the one view of the world. Build on being popular and you'll have an entirely different view of what's happening around you. The foundation God wants us to build our lives on is faith in Him. Another word for worldview is doctrine. Okay? We're going to get into that in just a moment. If you ain't having to write nothing down yet, just chill. All right? Another word for worldview is doctrine. Stay with me, I like this. Don't let your mind go down the wrong path when you hear the word doctrine. Right? Many of us think of anything many of us can't think of anything more dry or boring than the word doctrine. We envision a pastor lecturing on, in a monotone voice while most of us are all asleep when we think of the word doctrine. Wake up. All right. So what is Christian doctrine? And I'm, saying, I'm telling you, we're starting from the ground up, y'all, from this, so just bear with me. What is Christian doctrine. Y'all ready to start right? Here we go. Christian doctrine is an organized summary of what the Bible teaches about the most important issues of life. Christian doctrine is an organized summary of what the Bible teaches about the most important issues of life. Or to put it another way, doctrine is the studying of God has to say, what God has to say about such things as this. How do I determine right from wrong? What happens when I die? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do people act the way they do? Where do I find the life that I've longed for? Charles Swindle says this. Listen to this. This is so good. What roots are to a tree, the doctrines are to the Christian. From them we draw an emotional stability, our mental food for growth, as well as our spiritual energy and perspective on life itself. By returning to our roots, we determine precisely where we stand. We equip ourselves for living the life God designed us to live. Another word you're going to hear a lot in this series is the word theology. A working definition of theology is faith-seeking understanding. Faith-seeking understanding. The word theology literally means the study of God. Study is an important part of theology. You cannot, you, you can have no theology without study, without seeking understanding. Listen to this. Christianity is a thinking faith. If you're not asking questions, you're not growing in faith. In fact, it's my hope that this study will stir up some questions. However, questions by themselves are not enough. You have to seek the answers. This is a study that will often make you think, and that's not always easy. Sometimes, someone has said this, anyone who gives people the illusion that they are thinking will be loved by them. Anyone who, who gives the illusion that they, are, that they are thinking will be loved by them. Whereas anyone who actually prompts them to think will be hated. And I'm going to say this right there. Some of my, and y'all can testify to this, some of my teachers in school that was the hardest looking back on was my favorite teachers, right? They made you think. They made you worry, and it was exciting. Does that make sense? Um, 
Thinking about the truth is like exercising. We tend to resist it at first, but enjoy its benefits afterwards. Y'all don't look at me and judge. All right? All right. <clears throat> I love this. and this. Many may have come to this study for several different reasons. You may have questions, not just questions about verses that are found in the Bible, but deep questions about life. You want to reconcile your faith with the questions that arise from the mess of everyday life. You may have doubts. You may even be un unsure whether you believe in God. I'm glad that you're all here and invite you to dig in the truths of God. You may have heard someone say in regard to the Bible, don't think about it, just accept it. I want you to know that we're not going to do that here. This is good. God's truth can stand the closest scrutiny. Amen? You don't have to check your brain at the door when you come to church. After all, God made our brains. You may just want to know more about the Bible. You're interested in what it has to say. As we study God's Word together, you're going to find that the Bible is filled with answers. It often might not say what you expected to hear. But it always has a ring to truth, of truth. Whatever the reason you have coming here, you won't be the same person you are now when you complete this study series. It goes on, and, and, and we're going to dig in. Like I said, this is from the ground up, and we're going to dig into basically from the foundations of, of what we believe and why we believe it. And, and it's just dissecting God's Word, and it's going to be really, really good. So, so why learn doctrine? Here we go. Because knowing the truth about God helps me know God better. Knowing the truth about God, knowing the truth about God helps me know God better. Y'all with me? Some of y'all? A guy named J.I. Parker said this. We are cruel to ourselves if we try to live in this world without knowing the God whose world it is who runs it. The world becomes a strange, mad, painful place for those who don't know about God. Living in this world without knowing God is like driving with the windows blacked out. Listen to this. It doesn't matter how hard you step on the accelerator or what direction you steer. You keep running into things and you never get anywhere. We all have to have a deep desire to know God. To even hear it in phrases like, we even hear it in phrases like, Oh God or My God that people utter when they are shocked. The good news is God wants us to know Him that's why he sent Jesus his son and has given us his word. Y'all just bear with me. Let's put this into perspective. Knowing truths about God is not enough to give you a relationship with him. We all know people who know truths about the Bible and about God, but really don't know him in a personal way. Still to get to know God better and, and, and still to, to get to know God better and better, you and I must learn more and more the truth about Him. The desire to read God's Word and to learn about Him is a sign of your love for God. I want to say that again. Very simple. The desire to read God's Word and learn more about Him is a sign of your love for God. Imagine a college student saying to his girlfriend back home, I received 23 love letters you wrote to me this semester, and I intended to read them as soon as things settled down a bit. But I really do love you. How would that go over? If you're going to get to know God, you have to know the truth about him. You cannot develop a relationship with, with God based on your guesses or wishes about what he's like. Healthy relationships are built on truth. 
You cannot know someone if you believe a lie about them. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 2 through 5 says this. Listen carefully to wisdom. Set your mind on understanding. Cry out for wisdom and beg for understanding. Search for it like silver and hunt for it like hidden treasures. Then you will understand respect for the Lord. And you will find that you know God. Isn't that good? God has made us all for a purpose. Yet sometimes we miss the most important purpose for which we were made. You weren't made to be and to have a successful career or to produce wonderful children. I know you did, you know. Or to have lots of money. You were primarily made to know God. Isn't that good? Kay Warren says this. This is good. Put this on your refrigerator. Knowing God will make you wise. Knowing God will open your eyes. Knowing God will give you hope. And knowing God will help you cope. There's a second reason why it's worth the time to learn God's truth. It's because knowledge is an essential foundation. Knowledge is an essential foundation. I'm telling you, we were just barely getting started, y'all, and, and it's already 7.15, I think. Hebrews chapter 6, 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about Christ. Let us press on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith toward God of instruction or doctrine about washings or baptism and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead of eternal judgment. We all build our lives on a foundation that guides the decisions we make and the directions we take. Let me say that again. We all build our lives on a foundation that guides the decisions that we make and the directions that we take. Sometimes we try to build foundations on our opinions of others. But we get a lot of different opinions. Sometimes we try to build our foundations on the opinions of others. But we get a lot of deferring opinions. Sometimes we attempt to make our feelings our foundation. Do I like do I feel like doing it? That's a very popular one. Do I feel like doing it? Sometimes I feel like doing the wrong thing. Sometimes I feel like doing the right thing. Sometimes we try to build our foundations on traditions. It's worked for others, then it'll work for me. Listen to this. But the only foundation that is strong enough to build on is knowledge of God. Just as you know your ABCs because before you can read and write, you have to know the truth about God before you can live right. I love that. That sounds so simple and it rhymes every time. Just as you have to know the ABCs before you read and write, you have to know the truth about God before you can live right. Building a good foundation for life takes a great deal of time. And to be honest with you, it's tough work. To build a foundation, you have to get down and dig. I honor, I honor you for being here. By taking part in this study, you're saying I'm willing to dig in. I'm willing to, to, to do the tough work. And I'm, building, I'm willing to build a lasting foundation for my life. So several questions that you may have could be, how do I grow as a Christian? And how can I be sure that I'm saved? 
how do I handle the fact that there is an evil, that there is evil in this world? Only the Bible has the answers. Look at two scriptures, Ruby. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. It should be in your book as well. Until we reach unity in faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we no longer are infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning of craftiness of men and deceitful scheming. This passage in Ephesians represents two clear pictures of what life is like without the foundation of God's truth. Have, have y'all been, we've all been there. Everybody in this room is saved. But we all can remember our life before then. And, and, the, and the scripture talks about these things. A life without foundation. Here's the examples it gives. You're tossed back and forth by the waves. Without truth, I'm vulnerable to circumstances. Think of a small fishing boat helpless in a raging sea. That's what life in this world is like without the anchor of God's truth. Amen? Can, can y'all imagine? Y'all been there. But can y'all imagine what it's like and what it was like going through this life without a relationship with Christ? There, there's, there's people who just don't get it. And, and that's what's so important about being grounded in God's truth. Not only knowing God's truth, but applying God's truth. It says this, blown here and there by every wind of teaching. Without truth, I'm victimized by false teachings. Look what Matthew chapter 7 verse 24 says. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had the foundation on the rock. Circle the words on the rock. Did you notice that there's two things that Jesus said about our foundation is built on? It's built on hearing, amen? Hearing these words of mine, but it's also built on what? Putting those words into practice. It takes both. So in this study series, we're going to not just hear the truth, we're going to challenge each to put into practice God's Word. It's all easy to have, I like this, it's all easy to have the three little pigs' faith. Amen. We build our lives with the straw or the sticks in our own ideas or emotions. It's just easier and quicker to do it that way. But then the troubles of life come along and huff and puff and blows down our faith. Amen? Not that I think we should get our theology from fairy tales, but in this case, I'd encourage you to be like the pig who built with brick. So why learn doctrine? Hope y'all ain't bored. Why learn about doctrine? Because doctrine feeds my soul. Illustration in the book says, have you ever gone on a liquid diet? Obviously, you can look at me until I haven't. But, uh, what happens? In just a few days, you, you, you could sell your firstborn child just for a carrot. Anything that has some crunch to it. Amen. Your hunger for solid food, that's a sign of maturity. You need solid food to sustain you. 
Doctrine is solid food for our soul. It's going, we're going to call it soul food. Look what Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. In pointing out these things to brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and the sound doctrine which you have been following. This nourishment of our soul is not automatic. We have to choose to eat this solid food. We have to chew for a while on some of the truths in the Bible in order to understand them. In Hebrews, we are warned very clearly that if we, decide to, if we don't decide to dig into God's Word, we will remain a baby Christian. Baby Christians are believers who always seem to have many needs then they never meet the needs of others. Hebrews chapter 5 says this, And though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have, become, you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. For he is a babe, but solid food is for the mature. Y'all know that scripture. You've got to hunger and grow in your knowledge of God. We all start out as this baby in Christ. And there's many of us and many folks who never truly mature because they're not feeding on God's word. And y'all, and we're never there. We should always be hungry for more and more and more. And, and throughout this study, hopefully, I know we're just in the, the very beginnings of this, we're going to keep on digging into several topics of, of what you've always heard about and what you've always known, but we're going to take each thing and just dig into it more and more and more. So uh, even if you've been a Christian, I know many of you have been a Christian for a long, long time, but it's good to go back and look at just the simple things of our, of our faith and why we believe what we believe. Uh, in this passage, circle the words need again and have come to need. The new Christians to whom this letter was written had taken a step backward. You need solid food not only to keep growing in faith but also sustain the spiritual life you already have. If you stop feeding on God's word, don't think you'll stay where you are. Without God's word, your spiritual life will weaken. Amen? It's through continued feeding on God's word that we are built up. Acts chapter 20 verse 32 says this, And now I command you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. Because knowing the truth enables me to serve others. 1 Timothy 4, 6 says this, If you give these instructions to the believers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. As you feed yourself spiritually on the words of faith and the true teaching which you have followed. First you feed yourself, then you serve others by sharing with them what you have learned. Would you like to encourage others as you read in Titus 1.9 says this. You must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. One of the keys to real encouragement is knowing the truth of God. Without God's truth, your encouragement is just words and that's pretty weak encouragement. I love this example. Suppose, suppose a friend shows up at your doorstep one evening filled with discouragement over a tough situation at work. Or maybe your friend is out of work. How are you going to provide comfort and encouragement? Invite them to watch a motivational YouTube video. Make a banana split. 
pat your friend on the back and say, ah, it'll be okay. To which your friend probably would say, how do you know it'll be okay? And that question pinpoints the difference between our saying that things will be okay and what God promises. It's entirely different to remind a friend that God says he will never fail us or forsake us. That encouragement your friend can bank on. And then make him a banana split. <laughs> because knowing truth protects us against error. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him. Strengthen the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow, hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and basic principles of the world rather than Christ. Once you get rooted in God's word, you will it will be difficult for anyone to throw you off with false doctrine. He gives a, an illustration there, but for a second time we're going to roll on. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14 says this, But solid food is for the mature, but by the constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Train themselves. Once you train yourself, then you will be ready to train others. How can you equip our, how can we equip ourselves and our kids for survival in, the, in, in this uh, disintegrating culture? With truth firmly believed, clearly taught, and consistently lived out. That's good. How do we do that? With truth firmly believed, clearly taught, and consistently lived out. Because how I think determines how I act. Right? Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says this. Be careful what you think because our thoughts, because your thoughts run your life. Beliefs determine behavior. Thoughts result in actions. Wow. We roll it. Beliefs determine behavior, and thoughts result in actions. We're, we're nowhere near going to get through with this tonight. There's no way near. Let me go on with this. If I were to tell you that I've taped a $100 bill under one of your chairs in this room, You would all check the bottom of your chair. At least, if you believe me, you would. Amen? Well, y'all don't believe me because y'all ain't checking. Let me stretch the illusion a little. We live in a world that tells us, here's where, where to find the $100 bills. So we spend our life struggling to find fulfillment in our job or satisfaction in our vacations. And all we come up with is old bubble gum. <laughs> the amazing thing is we often keep going back to the bottom of the chair again and again. You'd think we'd learn the first time, but our beliefs keep determining our actions. You cannot change the way you act without changing the way you believe. 
You cannot change the way you act without changing the way you believe. God's truth, listen, church, God's truth changes the way you act. It will change the way you parent. It will change the way you work. It will change the way you handle your business. It will change the way you think about the future or you think about the past. It will change you. Because I'm commanded to, number one, study the truth. Y'all, this is just the introduction. I promise you it gets better. If you're bored out of your mind, it's going to get better. We are commanded to study the truth. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. Handling accurately the word of truth. Knowing the truth enables you to better use the truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says this, as we just read. Is it, listen to this. It isn't just for pastors. Everyone is to learn how to actually handle God's word. The Bible doesn't tell us that, that all of us are to be teachers. The Bible doesn't tell us that all of us are to be teachers. That's a gift some have and others do not. But the Bible does tell us that we're all responsible to know the truth for ourselves. We're not to rely on just what others tell us. We're to, we're to study the truth for ourselves. So I'm commanded to study the truth and number two, I'm commanded to live the truth. The prayer in Psalms 25 is a prayer that we should pray every day of our life. It says this. Teach me to live according to your truth, for you are my God who saves me. I always trust in you. Titus 1.1 says this. I have been sent to bring faith to those who have chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. There are two important facts in this verse. First, to live the truth. First, to live the truth. And you have to know the truth. Second is to know the truth. You must first learn the truth. You would expect to pick up. <laughs> you wouldn't expect to pick up a trumpet. And know how to play. You'd have to learn. It is the same with God's truth. You and I can't keep. God's command. To live the truth. Unless we. Take the time. To learn the truth. So we got to study the truth, live the truth. And number three, defend the truth. Defend the truth. The Bible demands that every one of us be ready and able to defend God's word. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says this, Sanctify Christ. As Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. That verse we've read numerous times. I preached through 1 Peter. And, and, and I, I want you to notice the words again. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Number one, part of that verse there is talks about where people can see, how can I have that hope that is in you? Tell me how I can have that. Show me how I can have that. Notice the truth, listen to this, notice that the truth 
Notice that the Bible even tells us what attitude we should have when we defend the truth. This is good. A lot of people defend the truth in a loud, with loud capital letters. Amen? With an overbearing and even angry attitude. The Bible tells us to be reverent toward God and to be gentle towards others as we defend the truth. You ever met somebody that way? Who does it right the opposite? I tell you what, I believe why I believe it. You don't believe it, you're wrong. Yeah. Amen. Y'all know people like that. <laughs> Amen. I can testify. You'll discover that people who are confident, you'll discover that people who are confident about the truth, who have built a good foundation, are able to defend the truth with gentleness and a quiet reverence. It's those who are unsure who have to yell the loudest. Mm. 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 Y'all don't know nobody like that, do you? Before we leave, I want to talk about the value of God's truth. And I want to give you one warning. Knowledge, listen to this church, y'all know this, knowledge all by itself can be very dangerous. Amen? Listen to this, we're almost, we're, 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 we're moving. Are y'all good? And I, and I hope I hadn't, I know we've went through this and y'all heard me read a lot, but I hope you've soaked some of this in. Knowledge is the foundation but it's just the beginning. Many believers fall into a subtle trap. Satan, knowing the magnificent things that God can build in our lives on the foundation of knowledge, sets a snare for us. He tempts us to think. You really know a lot. In fact, you know much more than the guy sitting next to you in church. You may even know more than your pastor. Shh, don't say amen. I knew, I knew Ross would. You ought to be proud of how much you know. Satan is trying to get you stuck on your knowledge. But what's the use of a foundation if you've never built anything on it? How do you make sure you don't fall into this trap? Knowledge must be balanced with discernment. Knowledge must be balanced with discernment. Philippians 1.9 says this, And this is my prayer, that, you, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best. Discernment is the ability to see how the knowledge you've gained is to be used in living. Let me say that again. Discernment is the ability to see how the knowledge you've gained is to be used in living. We've all known people with great knowledge who can't seem to make it work in their own lives. The physician who is a chain smoker, amen, or the, the, the college uh, psychology professor who has had five divorces. Warning signs of knowledge without discernment. Knowledge remains theoretical. One person or group become a person's exclusive source of knowledge. Listen to this. Those without discernment easily fall prey to the personality of a false teacher. So, number one warning, again, knowledge must be balanced with discernment. The second warning is this. 
Knowledge must be balanced with grace. Knowledge must be balanced with grace. But grow in Second Peter chapter two verse uh, verse three. Second Peter three eighteen says this. But grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have to grow in both grace and knowledge. The knowledge of some people seems to have pushed all the grace right out of them. <laughs> Y'all quit thinking of those people. Y'all know. The knowledge of some people seems to have pushed all the grace right out of them. That's good. Warning signs of knowledge without grace. Learning more about God without growing closer to God. I'm going to say that again. Y'all listen to me. Warning signs of knowledge without grace is learning more about God without growing close to God. You know what that's called? Legalism. Legalism, as many of you know, is a result of thinking you can grow closer to God just by keeping the rules or by forcing rules on others. Rules never produce growth. Never. Christianity is not a religion of rules. It's a relationship with God. Can I get an amen? I got holy bumps. So, so warning signs, y'all. Knowledge must be balanced with discernment, number one. Number two, knowledge must be balanced with grace. And last but not least, knowledge must be balanced with love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2. If I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, but have not love, I have Nothing. Nothing, not a zilch, zero goose egg. That's pretty clear, isn't it? You don't have to do the math for that to add up. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 says this. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Knowledge is not the problem. The problem is, Ross, the lack of Love. Real quick story. <clears throat> it was required in Jesus' day that they take care of their aging parents, even if it was a financial burden. A group of religious men called Pharisees found a way, found a way around that. Okay? They would call a portion of their income or wealth dedicated, quote-unquote, to God. Since God was more important than their parents, they would not have to spend that portion on their family. Of course, since these Pharisees were serving God, they could then justify spending the money on themselves in a variety of ways. How does this true story make you feel? Maybe you're thinking, I would never act that like that. Remember, knowledge puffs up. If I, listen to this, if instead you and I are able to think, Lord, show me how I will let what I know become an excuse not to love. We're on our way to the attitude that Jesus wants us to have. Why do you think the New Testament is filled with stories of judgmental Pharisees? Not so that you and I can feel morally superior to them. God put those stories there because all of us tend to act like the Pharisees. Warning signs of knowledge without love. Knowledge leads to intolerance of others. Growth in knowledge leads to growth in pride. We've looked at, at, at several things tonight through this introduction, and we actually made it through it, believe it or not. But we're, we're going to dig in to, to several things. There's a, there's a chart on, on your last page of this, of this section here. And, and you're going to see, let me just read this to you. 
We've looked at several, seven convictions and warnings regarding investing our hearts and time in knowing God's truth. It's an investment that pays eternal dividends. Now look at me at the chart titled Building a Foundation That Lasts, which outlines what we're going to do in the study of the foundation courses. These areas of doctrine are the foundation of the Christian worldview. We live in a time when many people, even many Christians, build their worldview on a poor foundation. But doing so is frustrating because your worldview keeps letting you down. You don't have to live with that frustration. God wants you to learn and love and live in His truth, building on the only foundation that lasts, and that's God's truth. Look at the three headings across the top chart. It says, learn it, love it, and live it. Learn it, love it, and live it. The hard fact is that if you're not willing to live the truth that you'll be learning, all your studying will be a waste of time. We learn the truth to be able to live it. The topics that we're going to be going through this course Course one that you've got your book on that we're going to be going is number one, we're going to be talking about the Bible. The Bible is God's perfect guidebook for living. The second thing we're going to be talking about is God. God is bigger and better and closer than I can imagine. Third thing we're going to be talking about is Jesus. Jesus is God showing himself to us. The third thing we're going to be talking about is the Holy Spirit. God The Holy Spirit, God lives in me and through me now. The last thing we're going to be talking about is creation. Nothing, quote unquote, just happened. God created it all. Salvation. This is the course of the, the three books. Salvation. Grace is the only way to have a relationship with God. We're going to be talking about sanctification. Faith is the only way to grow as a believer. We're going to be talking about good and evil. We're going to be talking about the afterlife. We're going to be talking about the church. And we're going to be talking about the second coming of Jesus. I hope that little bit of, of tonight of the introduction of what we're going to be talking about and, and, and doctrine and what it means to not only know God's truth, but to apply God's truth and, uh, and how we... By knowing God's truth, we can obviously identify false teachings and we can do several things. And, uh, and the, the, the warning signs, which was so good in my opinion, of, of, of knowledge must be balanced with the discernment. Knowledge must be balanced with grace. And knowledge must be balanced with love. So that's the introduction. Uh, I hope y'all are all still awake. And uh, I hope... We get into next week, we'll be getting into part one of the Bible. And, uh, and then we'll be digging in, into that next week. Y'all good? Y'all awake? <laughs> All right, let's pray together. Father, we come to you tonight. Lord, we thank you and praise you again for allowing us to come to your house and dig into your word. Lord, I pray that we would simply, Lord, just grow close to you. Lord, that every single person in this room tonight would grow in their hunger to know you more. Even those of us who have been a Christian for a long, long time. If we're not feasting on your word and growing daily, then we're going backwards. And Father, Lord, I pray that we hunger for you. I pray that we want to know you more. And the more we know you, the more we spend time with you, the more we seek you, the more we're going to want to share you with those we come in contact with. That, that you would just overflow from within us. That, that we would be able to defend the truth. That we would be able to not only know the truth, but we'd be able to live the truth. And we thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you be with us as we leave this place tonight. Keep us 
safe as we return here on Sunday. It's in Jesus' name we pray.